Toad by Gerald Haslam. Expector and Susandre, exclaimed Great Grandma when I showed her the small horned toad I had removed from my breast pocket. I turned toward my mother, who translated, They spit blood. De los ojos, Grandma added. From their eyes, Mother explained, herself uncomfortable in the presence of the small beast. I grinned. Ah! Oh! But my great grandmother did not smile. Son muy toxicos, she nodded with finality. Mother moved back an involuntary step, her hands suddenly busy at her breast. Put that thing down, she ordered. His name's John, I said. Put John down and not in your pocket either, my mother nearly shouted. Those things are very poisonous. Didn't you understand what Grandma said? I shook my head. Well, Mother looked from one of us to the other, spanning four generations of California, standing three feet apart, and said, Of course you didn't. Please take him back where you got him and be careful. We'll all feel better when you do. The tone of her voice told me that the discussion had ended, so I realized, so I released the little reptile where I'd captured him. During those years in Oildale, the mid-1940s, I needed only to walk across the street to find a patch of virgin desert. No neighborhood kids called it simply the vacant lot, less than an acre without houses or sidewalks. Not that we were desperate for desert then, since we could, we could walk into its scorched skin a mere half mile west, north, and east. To the south, incongruously, flowed the icy Kern River, fresh from the Sierras and surrounded by riparian forest. Ours was rich soil formed by that same Kern River as it ground Sierra granite and turned it into coarse sand, then carried it down into the valley and deposited over millennia along its many changes of channels. The ants that built miniature volcanoes on the vacant lot left piles of tiny stones with telltale markings of black on white. Deeper than ants, deeper than ants could dig were pools of petroleum that led to many fortunes and lured men like my father from Texas. The dry hills to the east and north sprouted forests of wooden derricks. Despite the abundance of open land, plus the constant lure of the river where de desolation and verdancy met, most kids relied on the vacant lot as their primary playground. Even with its bullheads and stinging insects, we played everything from football to kick the can on it. The lot actually resembled my father's head, bare in the middle but full of growth around the edges, weeds, stickers, cactuses, and a few bushes. We played our games on its sandy center and conducted such sports as, as ant fights and lizard hunts on its brushy periphery. That spring, when I discovered the lone horned toad near the back of the lot, had been rough on my family. Earlier, there had been quiet, unpleasant tension between Mom and Daddy. He was a silent man, little given to emotional displays. It was difficult for him to show affection, and I guess the openness of Mom's family made him uneasy. Dad had no, Daddy had no kin in California and rarely mentioned any in Texas. He couldn't seem to understand my mother's large, intimate family, their constant noisy concern for one another, and I think he was a little jealous of the time she gave everyone, maybe even me. I heard her talking on the phone to my various aunts and uncles, usually in Spanish, even though I couldn't understand. Daddy had warned her not to teach me that foreign tongue because it would hurt me in school, and she'd complied. I could sense the stress. I had been afraid they were going to divorce, since she only used Spanish to hide things from me. I'd confronted her with my suspicion, but she com comforted me, saying no, that was not the problem. They were merely deciding when it would be our turn to care for Grandma. I didn't really understand, although I was relieved. I later learned that my great-grandmother, whom we simply called Grandma, had been moving from house to house within the family, trying to find a place she'd accept. She hated the city and most of the aunts and uncles lived in Los Angeles. Our house in Oildale was much closer to the open country where she dwelled all her life. She had wanted to come to our place right away because she had raised my mother from a baby when my own grandmother died. But the old lady seemed unimpressed with Daddy, whom she called Ese Gringo. In truth, we had more room, and my dad made more money in the oil patch than almost anyone else in the family. Since my mother was the closest to Grandma, our place was the logical one for her. But S.A. Gringo didn't see it that way, I guess, at least not at first. Finally, after much debate, he relented. In any case, one windy afternoon, my Uncle Manuel and Aunt Tony drove up and deposited four and a half feet of bewigged, bejeweled Spanish Spitfire, a square, pale face topped by a tightly curled black wig that hid a bald head, her hair having been lost to typhoid nearly sixty years before, 
her small white hands veined with rivers of blue. She walked with a prancing bounce that made her appear half her age, and she barked orders in Spanish from the moment she emerged from Manuel and Tony's car. Later, just before they left, I heard Uncle Manuel tell my dad, Good luck, Charlie. That old lady's dynamite. Daddy only grunted. She had been with us only two days when I tried to impress her with my horned toad. In fact, nothing I did seemed to impress her, and she referred to me as El M M Malcriado, causing my mother to shake her head. Mom explained to me that Grandma was just old and lonely for Grandpa and uncomfortable in town. Mom told me that Grandma had lived over a half a century in the country, away from the noise, away from the clutter, away from people. She refused to accompany my mother on shopping trips or anywhere else. She even refused to climb into a car, and I wondered how Uncle Manuel had managed to load her up in order to bring her to us. She disliked sidewalks and roads, dancing across them when she had to, then appearing to wipe her feet on earth or grass. Things too civilized simply did not please her. A brother of hers had been killed in the great San Francisco earthquake, and that had been the end of her tolerance of cities. Until my great-grandfather died, they lived on a small ranch near Arroyo Cantua, north of Coalinga. Grandpa, who had come north from Sonora as a youth to work as a vaquero, had bred horses and cattle and cowboyed for other ranchers, scraping together enough of a living to raise eleven children. He had been, until the time of his death, a lean, dark-skinned man with wide shoulders, a large nose, and a sweeping handlebar mustache that was white when I knew him. His Indian blood darkened all his progeny so that not even I was as fair-skinned as my great-grandmother, as a gringo, for a father or not. As it turned out, I didn't really understand very much about Grandma at all. She was old, of course, yet in many ways my parents treated her as though she were younger than me. Walking, to the, walking her to the bathroom at night, and bringing her presents from the store. In other ways, drinking wine at dinner, for example, she was granted adult privileges. Even Daddy didn't drink wine except on special occasions. After Grandma moved in, though, he began to occasionally join her for a glass, sometimes even sitting with her on the porch for a pea-meal sip. She held court on our front porch, often gazing toward the desert hills east of us or across the street at kids playing on the lot. Occasionally, she would rise, cross the yard and sidewalk and street, skip over them, sometimes stumbling on the curb, and wipe her feet on the lot's sandy soil. Then she would slowly circle the boundary between the open middle and the brushy sides, searching for something, it appeared. I never figured out what. One afternoon I returned from school and saw Grandma perched on the porch as usual, so I started to walk around the house to avoid her sharp, mostly incomprehensible tongue. She had already spotted me. Venga, aquí, she ordered, and I understood. I approached the porch and noticed that Grandma was vigorously chewing something. She held a small white bag in one hand, saying, ¿Qué deseas, tomar? She withdrew a large orange gumdrop from the bag and began slowly chewing it in her toothless mouth, smacking loudly as she did so. I stood below her for a moment, trying to remember the word for candy. Then it came to me. Dulce, I said. Still chewing, Grandma replied, Mande? Knowing she wanted a complete sentence, I again struggled then came up with, Desco Dulce? She measured me for a moment before answering in nearly perfect English. Oh, so you want some candy? Go to the store and buy some. I don't know if it was the shock of hearing her speak English for the first time or the way she had denied me a piece of candy, but I suddenly felt tears warm my cheeks and I sprinted into the house and found Mom, who stood at the kitchen sink. Grandma just talked English, I burst between light sobs. What's wrong? she asked as she reached out to stroke my head. Grandma can talk English, I repeated. Of course she can, Mom answered. What's wrong? I wasn't sure what was wrong, but after considering, I told Mom that Grandma had teased me. No sooner had I said that than the old woman appeared at the door and hiked her skirt. Attached to one of her petticoats by safety pins were several small tobacco sacks, the white cloth kind that closed with yellow drawstrings. She carefully unhooked one and opened it, withdrawing a dollar, then handed the money to me. Para Suduzzi, she said. Then to my mother she asked, Why does he bawl like a motherless calf? It's nothing, mother replied. 